Supporters of Julian Assange say he should be released in the name of media freedom. He's in a London prison facing extradition to the United States on espionage charges. Washington says he should be prosecuted. So what does the future hold for the WikiLeaks founder? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Rob Matheson. Australian citizen Julian Assange remains in Belmarsh Prison in London. He's appealing against extradition to the US to face charges of espionage and computer hacking. Civil liberties lawyers and its supporters want him released. They say prosecuting him is an attack on media freedom. He founded the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. It published the biggest ever tranche of US diplomatic cables and military files. That revealed U.S. involvement in atrocities in the Iraq war and the inner thinking within Washington and Western governments across a host of issues. Publication was sometimes deeply embarrassing. Documents never intended to be made public revealed private positions contradicting the official line. Assange's opponents say he's gravely violated state secrets and should face justice. In a moment, we're going to be discussing all of this with our guests. But first, Fenton Monaghan has more on the case of Julian Assange. Come on, fire! This video was released by Julian Assange's WikiLeaks organization in 2010. Classified U.S. military video shows a helicopter gunship attack on a crowd of people in Baghdad. At least 12 Iraqis were shot dead, including a Reuters photographer and a driver. The U.S. military said it was engaging armed groups, a claim disputed to this day. If those killings were lawful under the rules of engagement, then the rules of engagement are wrong. Deeply wrong. It was revelations like this that put Assange in the spotlight and made him powerful enemies in Washington. And it was shortly after that his legal troubles began. It is common ground between... In 2010, Swedish prosecutors opened a rape and sexual assault case against him, and he handed himself in to police in London. Prosecutor. He was released on bail. In 2012, facing imminent extradition to Sweden, he took refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy. He feared that if he was sent to the country, the authorities there would extradite him to the U.S. Surrounded by British police wanting to arrest him, he remained confined in the embassy for the next seven years. The charges in Sweden were later dropped, but he was to face a much more serious problem. The U.S. now sought to have Assange extradited on charges of espionage. In 2019, Ecuador declined to continue sheltering him. Police dragged him from the embassy and he was jailed for breaking his bail conditions. The U.S. served extradition papers while he was behind bars. There's been a legal battle since. The British government has approved his extradition, but he's appealing. Assange is accused of leaking hundreds of thousands of documents, charges that could land him in jail for 175 years. The fate of the WikiLeaks founder remains in the balance. To some, he's a hero of free speech and journalism, deserving to be protected under law. To others, he's committed criminal acts and must face the consequences of his actions. Vincent Monaghan, Al Jazeera. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests. Now, in London, we have Rebecca Vincent. She's Director of Operations and Campaigns at Reporters Without Borders. Rebecca and her team were scheduled to meet Julian Assange at Belmarsh Prison on Tuesday morning, but the prison staff reversed the decision and barred them from visiting when they arrived. In Washington, D.C. is Bruce Fine, former U.S. Associate Deputy Attorney General and international lawyer. We're also joined in London by Jeffrey Robertson Casey. He's a human rights barrister and founder of Doughty Street Chambers. Jeffrey has been a former legal advisor to Julian Assange. A warm welcome to you all. Rebecca, I want to start with you. Talk us through what happened when you went to see Julian Assange. Well, Reporters Without Borders had negotiated access to visit him in Belmarsh today. This actually took months to get vetted by the prison to receive a confirmed visit time for this morning. We followed all of the relevant procedures and rules. We arrived early with all of our documents, but were then told that there had been a last-minute decision that we would not be allowed in. This was attributed to the prison governor. We were told that they had received 
intelligence that we were journalists and therefore would not be allowed in. Now, I want to make it really clear. Uh, Reporters Without Borders defends journalists. Some of my colleagues have a journalistic background, but we are an NGO. We work on cases like this as an NGO, and our prison visit was as an NGO, not journalistic in any way. The governor refused to speak to us about it, and we could not immediately rectify the situation. So we're deeply disappointed. And meanwhile, Julian Assange remains quite isolated in Belmarsh Prison, where he's been for nearly four years. There must have been speculation amongst you and your colleagues about why the governor was concerned about you going in. What do you think the governor was worried about that you might do as, as he put it, journalists when you were in there? Well, the decision was completely absurd because, of course, we would follow prison rules, as we have done. But this is the latest in a long line of barriers to many aspects of our work on the case. Um, For example, we have monitored the entire extradition proceedings in court, but we have faced barriers at each stage. Frankly, nothing is normal about this case. We have... At every point that we've encountered the UK authorities in particular, there have been problems. It has made our jobs extremely difficult. We are press freedom defenders. Julian Assange is now perhaps the most well-known political prisoner in the world. He has a right to receive visitors. We have a legitimacy as a press freedom NGO to visit him. We continue our campaign regardless. But frankly, uh, the decision, again, is ludicrous, arbitrary. And we call again on the prison to reverse this decision, to let us in, to visit him. What's your understanding of Julian Assange's uh, health and the conditions in which he's being kept? We've been deeply concerned about his well-being throughout his period um, of imprisonment at Belmarsh. Uh, Again, next week it will be four years, so that's a long time to be held um, in a prison alongside violent criminals. This is a man who has been convicted of no crime. He is being held only on remand as the extradition proceedings continue against him. We know that he suffers um, from severe mental health issues. We heard extensive evidence about this in court, including a risk of suicide. And he's had a number of physical ailments in prison as well, including at one point a mini stroke in prison that happened uh, during the appellate hearing in his case. There was also um, a lot of COVID on his cell and that resulted or on his, in his block at Belmarsh Prison rather and that resulted at times in him being held uh, almost in conditions of solitary confinement in his own cell in the prison. During a two-year period he wasn't allowed any visitors at all which further exacerbates his his mental health condition. So um, things are, are not good and one of the reasons we wanted to visit him was to be able to assess how how he was and what conditions he's being kept in. Jeffrey, Assange's father, John Shipton, has repeatedly said that this is a political case and therefore it needs a political solution rather than a legal one. How uh, accurate is that, do you think? This behaviour by the governor is not merely outrageous. In my view, it's unlawful. Once upon a time, a time about 20 or 30 years ago, journalists were not allowed to visit prisoners. Then the case was taken to the European Court of Human Rights and the policy changed. So if you have an agreement with the prison, it was unlawful for the governor to intervene at the last moment and to stop you. I mean, the person should be disciplined and you should take an action against him. But it is clearly outrageous at a time The British foreign minister is complaining about the treatment of Evan Kershkovich, uh, the American journalist who's been arbitrarily arrested and imprisoned in Russia, uh, to find that an agreement with a well-known NGO, who may be reporters or not, but you represent them, uh, which has been agreed, has suddenly at the last moment not only discourteously, but I would add unlawfully, being stopped. So I think that's something that you should uh, give some uh, thought to taking action. As far as Julian Assange is concerned, there is a matter of uh, a very serious matter here because he's been waiting for six months for the Court of Appeal to decide whether to approve his appeal on the two issues that were not uh, dealt with before, namely the issue of whether his extradition to America is barred by virtue of the rule against extraditing people for political reasons, and secondly, whether it's barred 
because it's an incursion on freedom of speech under Article 10 of the European Convention. Now, I've never known a case to take so long to get a decision from the Court of Appeal, but it does put Julian Assange in a kind of limbo, which he should never be in, because there are strong arguments for those two grounds, and so they should go ahead. Then there's a question of appeal to the Supreme Court, and then there's the question of a final appeal if the Supreme Court doesn't agree to the European Court of Human Rights. And even if it goes to America, it will be years before they decide whether the First Amendment trumps his prosecution, which in many people's view it does. Uh, this is a Trump lawyer's effort to say the First Amendment doesn't apply to foreigners, i.e. to Australians or to British journalists, so it's a controversial matter, or whether indeed the evidence that his own lawyers have been spied on, which was the case, saw the end of Daniel Ellsberg's prosecution for leaking the Pentagon Papers, uh, will stop his case. So we're looking, he's looking at five years incarceration in Belmarsh with suspected terrorists, and <laughs> that is the way Britain and America are treating someone who is in prison because essentially he published true information. As somebody who has advised uh, Julian Assange uh, in the past, his father, as I mentioned before, his father has repeatedly said this is a political case and needs a political solution, not a legal one. Given what you've said, given the fact that Assange is facing what appears to be an interminable period in the legal process, not even in incarceration yeah. in terms of having been found guilty uh, for, for doing something. How accurate would you say it is that this needs a political solution and a legal one is well, could, to some degree irrelevant? It could have one this year because there has been a sea change in uh, Mr Assange's home country, Australia. There is a new prime minister, Mr Albanese, who has said in the past that this has gone on too long. He said that as recently as December. And uh, there are ways in which previous administrations have got people out of Guantanamo. There was a man called Hicks who uh, was in Guantanamo for a long time and a lot of anger in Australia. And uh, so the prime minister then negotiated an arrangement whereby uh, he pleaded to a lesser charge, got uh, smacked on the wrist and came back to Australia. And I think, <clears throat> I gather that there have been some discussions to this end which have been held up by the Pentagon. Now, that may be resolved this year. I remember when I first acted for Mr. Assange about 13 years ago, I discussed the case with a friend who was very high up in the Obama administration, which didn't want to take action against him because they thought they'd have to take action against the New York Times, which published some of his material. And my friend said, look, we don't want him, but the Pentagon does. And the Pentagon, he added, normally gets its way. So I think that may be an internal conflict between uh, various parts of the Biden administration. We know there's a conflict at the moment over whether uh, the Pentagon will allow evidence that they have about Putin's war crimes to uh, be put in the hands of the Jeffrey, let me interrupt you there, because I want you've raised a very interesting point, which I want to, I want to put to uh, Bruce Fine in there Washington, D.C. Of a political solution. Where so there is the possibility of a solution. Bruce, let yes. me bring you in there. The, as, as Jeffrey was mentioning, the Obama administration decided it wasn't going to prosecute because it was going to. It was essentially caught between wanting to be seen to uphold press freedoms and finding a way uh, to prosecute the case. How much enthusiasm is there in the Biden administration for pursuing this, in your assessment? 
I think uh, none, but that doesn't mean that they won't continue to have the extradition treaty issue um, in play uh, throughout 2024. You got to remember at present in the United States, everything is focused on the next presidential election. Uh, and Biden is already calculating, all right, you know, if I give a pardon to Julian Assange, I drop the extradition, how is that going to play out with my Republican opponent? In addition, we know the intelligence community despises Julian Assange. I at one time represented Ed Snowden's father. And I can tell you, they <laughs> Julian is a little bit like Ed Snowden. Uh, they want to try to make an example of him so nobody else will ever do this again, even if it means dropping a nuclear bomb on a fleet. Uh, because one of the things that was clear with regard to both Mr. Snowden and Mr. Assange was that the information conveyed was truthful. That's what made it harmful. Uh, and what's important in free speech is not that everyone speaks, but that everything worth saying shall be said. Uh, so in the same way in which uh, Ed Snowden still remains under indictment, he sits there, he's obviously in Russia. We don't have an extradition treaty with Russia. There's no enthusiasm to get him back, but he's just going to stay there. I would be stunned if before the presidential election in 2024, there's any movement whatsoever to a so-called a political solution. But as a practical matter, yeah, if Mr. Biden wanted to end this overnight, he has authority to override the Pentagon, the NSA, or anybody else. They're all subordinate to him. We have civilian supremacy over the military. Uh, but Mr. Biden is a political animal, uh, and the Democrats are preoccupied about 2024. They're terrified that Trump perhaps could come back into the White House, and they do not view uh, any kind of leniency toward Julian Assange as being uh, an issue they'd want to run on in 2024. So that's where I see things are politically. I don't think it's going to happen. I do mm -hmm. think that even if he is extradited, there is a very strong free speech argument. Uh, after all, our free speech protects persons, not you know, particular citizens. Uh, and that to disclose truthful information, especially those that disclose government misconduct, is absolutely protected by the First Amendment an issue that was raised in the Daniel Ellsberg prosecution, but never got adjudicated because government misconduct derailed the case before it got to a verdict. Uh, and I'd certainly think that Julian would not have difficulty attracting very, very gifted legal talent to defend him under the First Amendment, which I think would be a, a wonderful gift to the American people. We need more sunshine on government, not less. Uh, Rebecca, Chelsea Manning stole much of the material um, that WikiLeaks eventually published. She, she was in the U.S. military at the time. She has had her sentence commuted by President Barack Obama back in 2017. Julian Assange just published the information, and yet he's now facing in prison. He's fighting extradition, as we were hearing earlier on. This could go for a very long period of time. What are the ramifications, in your assessment, of the ways that both of them have been treated? I mean, the implications of this uh, for journalism can certainly not be overstated. So Julian Assange is in a different role to Chelsea Manning and in a different role to Ed Snowden and other cases referenced because he is the publisher. One reason this case is so dangerous is that he would be the first publisher prosecuted under the Espionage Act, which lacks a public interest defense. If this precedent is set, this could be applied to any publisher, any journalist, or any source in any part of the world. Because remember, Julian Assange is not American. He has no ties to the U.S. He's an Australian national. The fact that the U.S. can go after somebody in this way already has no doubt had a chilling effect on national security reporting around the world. We will never know what stories have not been told because what, of what this man has gone through already over the past 12 years. But if they are successful in bringing him to the United States and prosecuting him there, he could face up to 175 years in prison simply for publishing information in the public interest. So we believe that this case matters deeply for journalism, for press freedom around the world. We are alarmed by the implications that could have. And so when we talk about this changing the future of journalism, um, really, it, it is not an exaggeration. Uh, Jeffrey Robertson, if this wasn't the U.S. who was asking for Julian Assange to be deported, but we substituted China or Russia, what do you think the reaction would be? Well, the reaction will depend on the country that's asking. And, of course, if it's China or Russia, the answer would be no. Uh, with America, the answer is always yes. And that is a reflection of this particular government. 
if we had been uh, under Mr. Corbyn or maybe even Mr. Starmer, uh, it might be leave it to the courts. But this government always bends over backwards. Uh, sometimes the courts intervene, and that is when you get real justice. In this case, it's uh, bizarre, though the first judge, very impressively, said that he shouldn't go to America because he was in danger of uh, being dealt with so badly in the uh, supermax prison system that he would, as an autistic man, he would be uh, likely to commit suicide. Now, uh, the, the Court of Appeal, <laughs> more traditionally, accepted American undertakings, and so we wait for the two other issues, which as my American colleague has said, are very important, the free speech and the uh, political uh, extradition exception to be decided. <laughs> our, our Court of Appeal is taking an unconscionably long time about deciding whether to hear that case, and then there are all the other cases down the line. But I think it must be said that one of the factors that uh, perhaps count against Julian Assange in America is the fact that we're virtually now at war with Russia, virtual war. We have uh, Russia where Putin is killing children and is indicted for kidnapping children. I mean, uh, it's monstrous what is happening, and it's a fundamental breach of international law, the crime of aggression. And so that does change things a little because the allegations are that subsequently, they're not actually concerned with this case, that subsequently he was fed information, although it's not clear that he knew it, uh, from some Russian hackers. But in fact, the problem for America is that it makes nonsense of its claim to free speech, which is one of the finest claims it could make. Uh, it does, it has been the leader in fighting for free speech, and it shows itself to be hypocritical by its uh, utter refusal. Or Jeffrey, its, I want to bring in Bruce Fine. Bruce is anxious to, to make a point here. Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to underscore, I think the leverage that uh, the United States has over uh, Great Britain in this context is uh, they're both members of Five Eyes. And I can guarantee you if Julian Assange uh, it would not be extradited, at least to the best that the British could do, the intelligence sharing would end. And I can guarantee you the intelligence people at MI5, MI6 are talking to the FBI and CIA and Director of National Intelligence, and they all despise. Julian, and that's why there's no way, given that political context, that the British would ever uh, resist extradition. Mm. Bruce, I want to ask you, back in October, I think it was, it was the U.S. Attorney General, Bruce uh, uh, Merrick Garland, had announced expanded protections for journalists. Now, how much, if at all, would that influence how the U.S. handles any eventual prosecution of Julian Assange? Well, I don't think that particular announcement has any uh, impact on Julian Assange. It simply stated that we would not be targeting, you know, journalists, you know, unless we had exhausted all other possibilities to try to get access to information. Even though our U.S. Supreme Court has held that there's no constitutional uh, uh, journalistic uh, privilege to keep the confidentiality of sources, you know, outside their jury. Of a, of a outside of a grand jury or, or a prosecution's case, uh, we have at the Justice Department, it was there when I was there, uh, created by regulation some limits on the circumstances in which we would see confidential sources of journalists. Uh, but Julian Assange's is an entirely different case because they're charging uh, the journalist uh, not with concealing a confidential source, uh, but having engaged in a crime itself. Uh, although it's true, that uh, Julian, unlike Ed Snowden or Daniel Ellsberg, uh, is being uh, prosecuted in his capacity as a publisher. Uh, there's no reason in the free speech to think that the individuals have any less rights to communicate uh, than news organizations. Uh, 
Um, they're all on equal par when it comes to speaking. And the reason is that I underscore free speech is intended to lead to an educated public. It doesn't matter the identity of the speaker. What's important is what is being said. And if what is being said is important to understand and check government abuses, whether it's an individual, a unicorn, a press, a music band, it's protected by free speech. Rebecca, um, we were talking about the fact earlier, obviously Julian Assange is an Australian citizen, and it was referred to that uh, the, the new Prime Minister of Australia seemed to be more enthusiastic about pursuing this. But the Foreign Minister, um, in the last couple of days, was seemed to be rowing back from that very slightly. Is there an indication that Australia perhaps is not as enthusiastic about getting involved in this case and putting pressure on the U.S. as perhaps Assange's supporters might hope? Well, for a number of years, Australia certainly did not do as much as I think anybody would hope in this situation, that our, our own governments would defend us if we are accused, especially for political reasons like this. Uh, but we've been encouraged by reports uh, that uh, the administration of Prime Minister Albanese has been um, raising this case diplomatically. And so we've reached out, we've attempted to engage as uh, Reporters Without Borders. We wrote a letter to Prime Minister Albanese ahead of his recent visit to the United States, where he met with President Biden. Um, and we understand that President Biden is expected to visit Australia in May for the Quad Leaders Summit. We are encouraging the leaders to discuss this case on the side because a diplomatic solution with Australia could be a way out of this for all parties involved. And in fact, we have information that today, uh, perhaps as we're speaking, the new Australian High Commissioner to London is in fact getting into Belmarsh Prison to visit Julian Assange. This will be their first visit. Um, we really welcome that. He needs support from his government and we encourage Australia to do everything in their power to find this diplomatic solution, uh, to protect him, to allow him to find a way out of this, and uh, for him and his family, if they desire, to return to Australia, to live safely and freely there, because they have this right. Uh, Rebecca, just very briefly, because we're into the last 30 seconds of, of the program, I'm afraid, what is your next move in terms of trying to get to see Assange again? Just very briefly, if you could. Well, we can we continue our campaign regardless. Um, we will keep trying to visit him in prison. We've made a formal complaint. I'll consider um, Mr. Robinson's um, uh, suggestion about possibly taking legal action. We'll continue to monitor any further court proceedings and fight everywhere we can for the release of Julian Assange because it matters so much for journalism around the world. Rebecca, thank you. Bruce, I'm afraid we have very little time, but I do want to hear from both you and Jeffrey. Bruce, what have you got to say? Well, the last point I wanted to make about Australia. Again, we've got the national security leverage, the sale of the submarines with the, the British billions of dollars, uh, the marine bases that are upgraded in order to oppose China. Australia, like Britain, is part of Five Eyes. There's no way, given those national security entanglements, that Australia would do anything that the United States says no to. So I think that's just a lost cause. I hate to say it because I believe in these circumstances, it's either a court win or we're going to lose. Uh, Jeffrey yeah. Robertson, just a final word from you. Australia does have a bit of clout, thanks to AUKUS. And you must remember that Australia has a great tradition of journalists who have embarrassed security services, going right back to the First World War, where the calamities of British generals were exposed by a journalist called Keith Murdoch. <laughs> he was the father of Rupert. Jeffrey, thank you very much indeed. I want to say thank you to all our guests, Rebecca Vincent, Bruce Fine, and Jeffrey Robertson. Thank you to you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rob Matheson, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.